lecture. This is one of our august July lectures. Um, and uh, <laughs> this uh, July lecture is uh, going to be given by John Ellis. John Ellis is uh, a very, very distinguished contemporary theoretical physicist um, who holds the position of head of theory at CERN, the European Centre for Nuclear Research. This is this big international laboratory in Geneva. Uh, it's quite an extraordinary laboratory, both its experimental and theoretical departments, which is extremely well known throughout the world of physics. Um, his undergraduate work was done at Cambridge, in which he got a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics. Uh, his PhD was done also at Cambridge in the Department of uh, Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. Uh, and uh, after that, he became a visiting, professor, a visiting professor or fellow at a number of institutions, King's College, Cambridge, Stanford, Berkeley, and several others. And he joined uh, CERN, with the International Laboratory, in 1979. And in 1988, he became the head of the theoretical section of this remarkable department. He's won a considerable number of accolades for science. He's a fellow of the Royal Society. He won the uh, Maxwell Medal from the Institute of Physics in London. He's a fellow of the Institute of Physics. And uh, he has uh, an honorary doctorate or two given by other universities. He's also massively interested in moral, model trains, Lego, T-shirts and uh, a lot of other very, very interesting activities. But um, one of his areas of expertise is particles in the cosmos. We're living in a time when particle physics, which is the world of the small, and cosmos, which is the world of the large, are coming together. And it has attracted an area which has attracted some of the best minds of our time. And tonight, the title is Particles in the Cosmos. John, hand over to you. Okay, well, uh, Jeff, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. I particularly like the way you uh, describe me as being contemporary. I always thought, thought of myself as being stuck back in the 1960s. But, uh, yeah. Well, in uh, your uh, list of my past crimes, you, you missed out the fact that I uh, came up with the name of penguin diagrams. And if uh, people want to ask me over tea or coffee afterwards, I'll explain to them how penguin diagrams got their name. Anyway, uh, as Jeff said, uh, in today's talk, what I'd like to do is to uh, give you a sort of uh, Cook's tour through uh, the cosmos, uh, following uh, the tracks of uh, elementary particles. In fact, uh, every now and then you'll see that thing flashing over there, and that's because there's a, a particle going through it. Uh, I'll come back, come back to that later. So uh, this uh, talk, uh, rather like uh, ancient Gaul, is going to be divided, roughly speaking, into three parts. What I'd like to do is, uh, in the first part, to uh, remind you of some of the developments uh, in the history of particle physics and how it is that uh, from the beginning, oh, sorry, from the end of the last century, we had the picture of atoms. At the end of this century, we have a picture of uh, quarks as the uh, fundamental constituents of nuclear matter. And uh, I'll, uh, as we go along that route, uh, underline the role played by cosmic rays. So that's the, the first connection between particles and the cosmos. Uh, then I'll review uh, the standard model of particles uh, as we've now established it uh, during the course of the last 20 or 30 years. And in particular, I'd like to highlight some of the tests of this model, which uh, are made using uh, particle accelerators, uh, such as in particular those at CERN where I work. And uh, well, you can see a picture of uh, CERN up there on the, on the screen. And uh, during the course of this talk, I'm going to try to uh, show you various other images on that screen to do with particles in the cosmos uh, using the World Wide Web, which was actually invented by some informa informatics people at CERN precisely to en enable physicists to communicate with each other around the world. So there you are, uh, web address up there. Then in the, the third part of this talk, I'll try to uh, bring together cosmology and particle physics. Uh, the many possible connections between particles and the cosmos, which I, I could discuss. Uh, the ones I've chosen are to discuss a little bit the, uh, the origin of the elements, uh, the origin of matter itself in the universe, 
Uh, I'll try to give some possible answers to why the universe is so large, why the universe is so old, again in terms of particle physics, and uh, also the formation of galaxies may well be driven by elementary particles. And then uh, at the end I'll just uh, briefly mention uh, some experiments that we're now preparing at CERN uh, with the help of some of uh, our colleagues here in Melbourne and elsewhere to uh, test some of these ideas. So let me start off uh, straight away by just uh, reminding you of uh, some of the uh, cast that's going to appear in uh, this talk. So going from uh, the top of the picture down to the bottom, we've got uh, the very largest uh, structures in the universe, clusters of galaxies held together by gravity, going down through uh, galaxies, solar systems, uh, planets, uh, in these cases here, other forces begin to play, uh, electromagnetic, strong, and weak nuclear forces in addition to gravity. Uh, then jump a few stages, I come to atoms. Uh, atoms, as we'll discuss in more detail, are of course composite objects made up out of electrons orbiting around uh, nuclei held there by electromagnetism. Uh, inside nuclei, as I'll discuss in more detail in a moment, we have particles called protons and neutrons held together by strong nuclear forces. Actually, we no longer believe that those nucleons are actually truly elementary point-like particles. We actually think that they're also composite, uh, made up out of quarks uh, held together by glue. And a little bit later, I'll try to uh, demonstrate to you how that works. Uh, as far as we can tell at the moment, uh, the quarks, the gluons, and the electrons are among the elementary consistent constituents of nature. But uh, there's no guarantee that they really are the smallest things. It's just the smallest things that we've been able to see so far in our experiments. Now, what I want to try to do during this talk is to lead you down this path here to these quarks, electrons, and gluons, and then try to show you that, in fact, although you think that these are at opposite ends of the transparency, in fact, uh, they're really connected together like this. Okay, so we'll come back to that later on. Now, as a starting point, I think it's uh, good to start with a situation as it was more or less a, a century ago. Uh, Jeff Opat, in his uh, talk next week, is going to uh, tell you about the discovery of the electron 100 years ago this year. I think it's useful to remind ourselves what was the status of physics at that time. So. Finally, the idea that atoms were the building blocks of matter was pretty much generally accepted. Of course, there were many different types of atoms. Uh, there was an incredible array of different elements. Uh, here's a famous uh, Mendeleev uh, table. Uh, those were the, if you like, basic constituents of matter, although at that time there were uh, almost 100 of them. Uh, how about the forces? Well, there were... Uh, two forces known. Maxwell had unified electricity and uh, magnetism, and uh, we've already seen how uh, electricity and magnetism play roles, for example, uh, in atoms. And uh, electricity and magnetism uh, had worked for you again. Uh, we also had a theory of uh, gravity. Uh, Newton had uh, discovered the theory of gravity. Uh, now, in fact, just around this time when this uh, picture emerged uh, was a time when the first truly em elementary particle was discovered, and uh, that was the electron discovered by Thomson in uh, 1897. And, uh, in fact, uh, here we uh, have something which is uh, rather like the uh, apparatus that he used to discover the electron. So there's a, a source, maybe I'll show you a picture of this. Okay, so there's a, a source uh, at the bottom here, and then there's an electric field which accelerates the electrons, and they shoot up here, and you can see them uh, making this little green light here. And uh, if you apply a magnetic field, you a magnet, if you apply a magnetic field, the thing bends, just as you see on uh, that screen up there. Uh, now, in fact, uh, the TV set which I uh, just switched on 
operating exactly the same principle. You have uh, a source at the back of it, you have an electric field to accelerate it, and if you apply a magnetic field, then <laughs> <laughs> And uh, in fact, if you turn this picture on your side, you can see that J.J. Uh, Thompson's apparatus, or this piece of apparatus here, basically operates on exactly the same principle as the TV. And that's a, a picture which we'll uh, also keep on uh, one side just to uh, remind ourselves. Okay, so at the end of the 19th century then, uh, we had these atoms, but there were beginning to be suggestions that uh, atoms were not the end of the story. Uh, I've already uh, demonstrated to you uh, the electron, as discovered by J.J. Uh, Thompson. Uh, there were other suggestions that uh, there might be something else inside the atom, there might be some structure inside the atom, uh, various different uh, forms of radioactivity, and uh, I'll demonstrate those to you in uh, just a second. The key experiment, though, which uh, convinced uh, physicists that indeed atoms were complicated objects was an experiment uh, carried out by Geiger and Marsden and uh, interpreted by Rutherford, and as always, the theorists get the credit. Uh, so what he did was he scattered, scattered uh, things called uh, alpha particles of the atoms, and uh, what he found was what they found was that uh, most of these alpha particles went uh, all the way through, as if there wasn't anything inside the atom at all. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a very few of them uh, bounced back, as if there was something small and hard in the center which was scattering the things back. And uh, the interpretation of this was that inside the atom, a very tiny fraction of the space inside the atom was actually occupi occupied by some hard little thing which must have extremely strong interactions in order to be able to make things uh, bounce back like that. Now, that was the story uh, in about the year 1910. But uh, it was realized in the following decades that uh, nuclei were themselves not elementary particles. Uh, they looked very complicated. There were very no many different uh, states of nuclei, had a very complicated spectroscopy, much like atoms themselves were by this time known to have a complicated spectroscopy. And uh, indeed, it was uh, discovered that uh, inside the nuclei, there were two different types of particles, rather similar, called protons and neutrons. Uh, one of them had an electric charge, that's the proton, and one of them does not have an electric charge, it's neutral, so obviously enough, that's called the neutron. And uh, just to sort of situate you, the uh, masses of each of these particles is about equal to the mass of a hydrogen uh, atom. So if you look then at the situation in around the year 1930, uh, you would have had uh, protons and neutrons and electrons as what appeared at that time to be the elementary particles. And uh, how about the forces at this time? Well, of course, there was the electromagnetic force, the one which uh, Maxwell had uh, unified, uh, binds atoms, uh, binds electrons to nuclei inside atoms. It makes waves, right, which uh, propagate through the atmosphere to bring you your TV signal, which I guess they don't anymore because you probably use cable. But anyway, <laughs> in the old days, TVs used waves, right? <laughs> as discovered by Hertz. And uh, electromagnetic fields can extend over an extremely large range. In fact, you have, uh, if you look at astrophysical situations, magnetic fields which are comparable to the size of galaxies. Uh, it was Einstein who pointed out that not only uh, were uh, there um, waves associated with this electromagnetic field, uh, but there were also carrier particles. He showed that many aspects of the absorption of these electromagnetic waves by matter could be understood in terms of the absorption of little particles called photons, denoted by gamma, which uh, didn't have any electric charge. So that's the electric force, electromagnetic force. Then I've mentioned, in, en passant, the strong and weak nuclear forces, and perhaps now is the time to uh, address those a little bit more closely. So 
So the strong nuclear force is the one that uh, holds the protons and neutrons together inside those tiny little nuclei which make that big scattering of the alpha particle. It has a short range. The uh, size of the nucleus is something like 10 to the minus uh, 12 centimeters. Uh, people have never really discovered long range waves or carrier particles associated with the nuclear forces. Uh, now, however, one can see evidence of this force in the laboratory with certain types of radioactivity. There's a type of radioactivity called alpha, where which can be understood as nuclear breakup. Now, I've actually got an example kindly provided by uh, Jeff Taylor here of uh, an alpha source. We hope that it would be possible to put this uh, alpha source uh, inside this magnet and then verify that the alpha particles are fed. But unfortunately, it's rather a weak source, and the alpha particles are very, very far from there, and we're not actually able to work up on them. Another form of uh, radioactivity is uh, actually the admission of these uh, photons to the gamma particles. So, uh, okay, so now I, I've introduced you to the uh, fundamental uh, forces of nature, all the way from uh, gravity to uh, electromagnetism and the two different types of nuclear force. Now, uh, right, so far, then we're at a stage where the elementary particles appear to be protons, neutrons, and electrons. Uh, in point of fact, during the two or three following decades, it was realized that the protons and neutrons were, again, themselves extremely complicated particles with a finite size. Uh, that size is the order of 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. Uh, there were very many different excited states, much like atomic or uh, nuclear excited states. And uh, Hofstadter and collaborators did uh, low energy scattering experiments, which were able to measure the uh, shape the distribution of matter inside the proton, and they found that it was an extended object. Subsequent higher energy experiments found that this uh, extended bell-shaped curve here was in fact not some sort of schmear like jelly. It was in fact more like raspberry jam with little pips in it. And that this distribution of charge here was actually made up of tiny little things which, as far as anybody could tell, were point-like, uh, dashing backwards and forwards in such a way that they filled out this uh, bell-shaped distribution. And uh, one of the key experiments to do this, uh, was uh, to establish this, was done by Taylor, Kendall and Friedman at the uh, end of the 1960s. Now, it's uh, these little point-like things, dashing backwards and forwards, which uh, are the quarks, and which, as far as we can tell at the present time, are the most elementary things inside the nucleus. 
they seem to be those small uh, Euclidean points in the same way as the electron. <coughs> and if you want to make up a proton, then you uh, use three of them. Uh, you do use a different set of three to make up neutrons. You can make up protons and neutrons using two different types of quark, which were called uh, whimsically uh, up and uh, down type quarks. Now there is one uh, puzzle, well it's a puzzle for the theoretical physicists, which is whereas you know, we were able to see electrons coming out of atoms, nobody has ever been able to extract a quark from a proton or a neutron or a nucleus. Uh, they're what we call uh, confined. This doesn't bother us particle physicists particularly much. And I'll show you specifically in a moment later on uh, what quarks look like in a modern day experiment. Now, uh, you just need these two quarks to uh, make up uh, ordinary matter. So you might just say, well, okay, we just replace the proton with neutrons by quarks up and down, and we just carry on. But in fact, uh, this uh, year is not only the uh, 100th anniversary of the uh, discovery of the electron, it's also the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the third quark, uh, the strange quark, which was uh, discovered in the form of uh, nuclear particles uh, detected uh, in cosmic rays. As I said, that's a cosmic ray detector over there, although those probably aren't strange particles. Uh, the strange quark was discovered uh, in 1947. See, maybe uh, I'll try now to uh, show you the uh, picture that we have. Here again, courtesy of the World Wide Web, is uh, an image of the uh, atom for you to uh, contemplate uh, with the uh, quarks inside the protons and neutrons inside the nucleus with the uh, electrons orbiting around. Uh, now, the uh, strange quark was in fact uh, not the first uh, heavier or exotic, unstable form of elementary particle to be found. Uh, the first one to be found was actually something called the muon, which is a particle which is very much like the electron. It seems to have identical properties, except for the fact that it's heavier. And nobody understands uh, why it's heavier, but it seems to have no strong nuclear interactions. And this was actually first detected in cosmic rays in 1936, <coughs> although when the, the muon was initially discovered, uh, people didn't understand its properties uh, correctly, and it wasn't really identified until about a decade later. As I said, it was discovered in cosmic rays, and these things which are coming through here are, are very probably muons. So uh, that's another elementary particle for you. So I uh, introduced you to uh, three or four different elementary particles by this stage. Sometimes people think of elementary particles as being very exotic things that uh, you know, don't you know, happen, right? But they do happen. They're happening over there happening over there, even happening in your TV set. Uh, now, if you go to uh, other types of uh, elementary particle, uh, many more have been found in the last two or three decades uh, using accelerators. Uh, these include uh, the charm quark, uh, which was discovered in 1974, uh, tau lepton, which is another sort of heavy electron, which was discovered more or less the same time, a little bit later, uh, the bottom quark, which was also discovered in the 1970, and uh, finally the top quark, which is uh, the most recent uh, elementary particle to have been discovered, uh, evidence for that was found at Fermilab in the United States about two years ago. Uh, perhaps I can uh, use Sam's web again to show you a little bit more detailed information about fermions. So uh, for those of you who want uh, more details of the properties of the fermions, you have them on this picture here. These are the electrons and related particles, and these are the various different types of quark. Now, 
I'd like to uh, say a little bit more at uh, this stage about the uh, weak force in particular, because I want to, to try to uh, introduce you to uh, another uh, elementary particle. Uh, let's go back to uh, radioactivity. Uh, radioactivity was understood to be the uh, breakup of uh, a neutron, which produced a proton and an electron, and it's that electron which is the uh, beta particle. Which we have the beta particle didn't come straight up; it was bent by the magnetic field. Now, unfortunately, this apparatus is uh, rather crude, so you you can't really see it directly, and you're going to have to take my word for it. But uh, if you looked at the angles at which these electrons or beta particles uh, came out, you would find that they were spread out in angle. Whereas if you did the same experiment with that alpha source, which I mentioned earlier on, all the alpha particles would come out in the same direction. So what is going on here? The interpretation is that these electrons that are coming out here are coming out at different speed. They have different energies. The ones which have less energy, one arrow, are bent more easily by the magnetic field. The ones that have more energy, the ones which have three arrows, are bent less by the <coughs> magnetic field. That's in contrast to uh, this little source here, or the TV set, where all the electrons are accelerated in the same way by the electric field. They all get bent in the same way, and so they make that little spot which dances around on your screen. Uh, in beta decay, this spot is all spread out because these electrons have different energies. Why is that? That's because of the particle, the uh, neutrino, which is admitted, admitted at the same time, uh, postulated by Pauli in 1930, but not actually observed until 1956. And because you're emitting the neutrino as well as the electron, the energy of the electron is not fixed, and you get this spreading out of the beam. Now, this picture of the weak interactions uh, survived uh, the development of the quark model. You just changed it from neutrons changing into protons to a quark alchemy with uh, a down quark changing into an up quark, for example. And the decays of all those heavier quarks and leptons that we had strange quark, the muon, the charm, and the tau, were all mediated by the same weak interaction, again, with this emission of neutrinos. So this then was a, a picture of the uh, weak force. And uh, if you look over on this picture here, you'll see that I've indica indicated here the neutrino associated with the electron, and other experiments showed that there are also neutrinos, like this one here, associated with the muon, and this one here, associated with the tau, that's sort of super heavy. Now, I want to say a little bit more about our current understanding of how these forces act. I talked about uh, the electromagnetic, uh, the weak, and the strong force. And uh, in the case of the electromagnetic force, uh, people say that there is this electromagnetic field and that there is this quantum associated with the electromagnetic field called the photon. And uh, you can represent the way in which this electric field acts uh, here. For example, we have a nucleus. Here we have an electron, some way away. And uh, photon particles are exchanged between them. And this would be a quantum way of understanding uh, the binding of an atom. Now, modern theorists have developed uh, very similar pictures for uh, the weak interactions and also the strong interactions all of which are currently understood as being due to the exchange of different types of particle. For example, the weak interaction has a W particle associated with it, and the strong interactions have a uh, gluon associated with it. So uh, now I have another little demonstration to show how it is that by exchanging a particle, you can have force, you can have what apparently looks like action at a distance. Thank you. 
all these uh, forces mediated by particles, so let's go to the next picture, and uh, here is summarized in more technical language our current uh, information about the properties of these various different carrier particles. Now, here on uh, one transparency, I've uh, written a sort of uh, reduction of the same information uh, by hand uh, showing you the fundamental forces that we've been studying the electromagnetic weak and nuclear forces uh, the particles that carry them the fact that some of them are very heavy weighing as much as a nucleus other ones are apparently massless the photon and the gluon some of them have a very large range some of them have a very short range and one of the big issues in particle physics today is to understand uh, why it is that these particles look so similar in some respects but behave so differently in other respects having uh, very heavy particles which only have a finite range and down the bottom here I've listed all the different quarks and leptons as we call the electron neutrinos and associated particles uh, the fundamental elementary particles of matter that, uh, that we know of uh, which uh, arrange arranged in pairs so this is the up and the down the neutrino uh, the electron and its neutrino and then similar other sets now uh, this set of particles here is now our current understanding of the elementary particles of nature and the dynamics of these particles is described by what we call the, uh, the standard model now this model has been uh, tested and verified, for example, uh, in experiments at uh, LEP uh, with extremely high precision. So perhaps I'll move to my next uh, wave image. So I'll just first of all go back to this. This is a, a picture of uh, CERN. And uh, here we have the uh, tranquil Swiss and uh, French countryside with the mountains uh, and the snow in the background. What goes on beneath the surface is that you have many accelerators accelerating particles around in circles here. Uh, let me just move this image up a little bit. Okay. So uh, these are the first accelerators that CERN had, which are relatively small somewhat larger one. This is the largest one that we have currently. This is an accelerator which we uh, call LEP, uh, with which we do nowadays precision tests of the standard model of particle physics. Uh, just to make accelerators feel like something homely, I remind you that uh, this thing here is an accelerator. Uh, a source of electrons, a name of some kind, I know of. Falls at the back there, and then the electrons are accelerated, uh, and then they hit the screen, they bend by electric the magnetic field. The accelerator is just like that, except that now you bend them in the magnetic field around in a tremendous great big circle, and you accelerate them from the ground. Okay, so you've got uh, an accelerator in, uh, in your living room. Now, why is it that you uh, don't see those accelerators 
from the previous picture? Well, the answer is shown here. The answer is that uh, all those accelerators are actually situated something like 100 meters underground. Uh, this here is the uh, tranquil countryside which we saw earlier on. Uh, here is the left accelerator, actually between 50 and 150 kilometers underground. And uh, this is small access pits, but otherwise on the surface you don't see any trace of these uh, experimental areas. So, what do people actually do? Well, at uh, LEP, uh, what we do is we bang together electrons, the same sort of electrons we have in your TV, uh, together with their antiparticles called uh, positrons. Uh, one thing which I perhaps should have mentioned earlier is that uh, Dirac, towards the end of the 1920s, pointed out that uh, every type of particle must be accompanied by an antiparticle, antimatter, uh, which should have identical properties. And uh, what we do in LEP and other accelerators is take the particle and the antiparticle, we accelerate them to extremely high energies, and we collide them together. The energy, according to Einstein, can be converted into mass, and in that way we can make uh, new particles, maybe extremely massive particles. Now, I have here a web image of uh, a somewhat, somewhat more detail of one of these uh, detectors, which is uh, situated around the, uh, the left tunnel. So the uh, collisions take place along this axis here. So here's the positrons coming this way, the electrons coming this way. You make the collisions in the middle here, and the particles come out, and the various different types of particles are detected in this apparatus around the outside here. Uh, I'll definitely move this image up a bit. This is just so that you get the scale uh, here are a couple of uh, regular sized uh, people uh, admiring the apparatus. Uh, this particular apparatus is uh, in a uh, cavern 150 meters underground. And, uh, some years ago, uh, Stephen Hawking came to uh, visit CERN and uh, we took him down the elevator shaft on this uh, uh, wheelchair. And we, we went, we looked at uh, Alec and uh, I asked him, well, what do you think of it? And he said, well, actually, it's computer said, this reminds me of one of those James Bond movies <laughs> where there is a mad scientist trying to take over the world. <laughs> so, so what do you actually see when you look at collisions in such an apparatus? This uh, is a, uh, when it eventually comes, is a uh, computer reconstruction of uh, one particular collision. So the electron and positron go into and out of the screen here, and then they produce a pair of particles, in this case a muon and an anti-muon, which uh, go off in opposite directions, and they leave some little traces of their passage as they go, but basically the muons escape from the apparatus. That's one example. <coughs> this one which is coming up now is going to be where the electron and positron collide and they make a quark and an anti-quark and they shoot off in opposite uh, directions one went this way, one went this way and each of them produced showers of particles as you can see I think this is the sort of picture which you show to philosophers of science who say the quarks don't really exist because they're confined and you can never actually see them you can see them, and uh, to the untrained eye, this picture doesn't look too much different from the muon anti muon picture, which uh, anybody would agree shows uh, real particles. I can't resist showing yet a third picture. <laughs> well, uh, I can't resist trying to show a third picture. Let me correct myself. I don't know what's. Uh... Well, while he's thinking about it. Ah, there we go. So, uh, in this uh, picture here, 
you actually see three jets coming out one, two, and then the third splash of pretty colours over there. So what's going on here? Well this is an event where you're producing a quark, an antiquark, and a gluon is coming out. So you know, these gluons which uh, well, the middle tennis ball over there is not just a figment of my uh, imagination. Uh, this is the middle tennis ball coming out. Okay, so what are some of the results that uh, have been obtained? Well, as I said, the standard model works with incredibly high precision. Uh, it has told us that there are only three different types of uh, neutrinos, and hence presumably only three different types of electron-like particles, and presumably only six types of quarks. It indicates that the fundamental forces are likely to be unified in some uh, grand unified theory, which I'll return to in a moment. Uh, it even enabled us to predict ahead of time uh, the existence and the mass of the top quark, which was found somewhat later at Fermilab. And uh, I'll come to the Higgs boson in a moment. Uh, this, for example, is uh, one of the plots which shows you uh, how many types of neutrinos there can be in the world. Uh, these are uh, plots of the number of events you get at different energies, uh, and you can see the numbers predicted, the solid lines, are different if there are two, three, or four types of neutrinos. And you see that everything agrees very well with three types of neutrinos. Uh, my favorite joke, which I always trot out, and I apologize to those of you who heard me say it before, I had hoped that the number of neutrinos would turn out not to be three. I had hoped it would turn out to be pi, or... Uh, <laughs> E, e would have been even more interesting, but uh, it turns out to be uh, precisely three, and uh, this not only tells us how many different types of neutrinos there are, but also constrains the properties of other particles, such as those that are conjectured to be the dark matter filling up the universe. So, as the guy selling the street newspaper out there on Swanston would say, what are the big issues? If we have this standard model which works so well, why don't we just you know, pack up and go home? Well, I'll give you a couple of reasons why we don't do that, apart from the fact that we want to continue getting paid. Uh, one is that uh, we don't know where the masses of the element elementary particles come from. Uh, why is it that some of them are very heavy, like the top quark, and some of them don't weigh anything, maybe, like the neutrinos? Why are the W and the Z so heavy? Why is the electron so light? And uh, us theorists have an idea in our uh, back pocket, and it's called something called the Higgs boson, uh, which is uh, now the quarry of uh, most uh, high energy experiments that are being done, uh, or planned in the future. Uh, another big issue which uh, we worry about is we have all these different types of interaction. I talked about the electromagnetic, the weak, and the strong interaction. Einstein spent you know, the last 40 years or so of his life, yeah, 40 years, uh, trying to find a unified framework in which instead of having three different fundamental forces, we just had one. And uh, this is still the uh, dream of us theorists. Yes, well, Einstein spent 40 years, I spent 20 years looking for this damn thing. We haven't found it yet, we're still looking. Uh, anyway, such a thing uh, predicts all sorts of interesting things, like, for example, maybe neutrinos are massive particles, maybe they could be the dark matter in the universe, and so on. So those are some of the big issues in particle physics, but I think that uh, now it's long time to uh, get on and make the connection between uh, particle physics and cosmology. So to do that, I want first of all to uh, review with you the three major pieces of evidence for the Big Bang. The first of these is that uh, the universe is actually expanding. Right? Hubble discovered that uh, distant objects in the universe, galaxies for example, are receding up from us at a speed which is roughly proportional to their distance from us. So the universe is getting bigger, uh, but it's getting bigger in a way which is almost homogeneous and isotropic. Whichever direction you look in, it looks more or less the same. Now, of course, if the universe is getting bigger and bigger all the time, 
you can you know, push the fast rewind button on the cosmological VCR and look back what was happening early in the history of the universe. And what you find, of course, is the universe in the past should have been much smaller than it is today. Uh, smaller also means hotter. And uh, in fact, uh, George Gamow predicted shortly after the Second World War that uh, in the universe today, there should be some uh, relic of the uh, Big Bang in the form of microwave radiation. Gamow predicted that we are living in a microwave oven. So you, you've got you know, a piece of cosmology right in your uh, kitchen, right, folks? Uh, I should have brought a microwave oven here just as a demonstration. <laughs> okay. Anyway, now these microwaves filling up the universe are believed to be emitted when the universe was something like a thousand times smaller than it is today and a thousand times hotter. Before then, electrons and nuclei were separated. They were not bound together in atoms. At that time, a thousandth of the size of the universe today, the electrons finally got bound to the nuclei, they made the atoms, and when they got stuck in to the nuclei, they emitted photons, and those are the microwave photons, which uh, we're all being bathed in today. And uh, I have here the uh, picture of the microwave background radiation. Sometimes the World Wide Web is a little bit like watching grass grow, isn't it? Okay. So anyway, this is uh, the uh, background radiation, the cosmic microwave background radiation. And uh, this curve here is supposed to be telling us that uh, theory and observation agree perfectly. In fact, they agree so perfectly that the error on the measurements is thinner than this line here. Okay. So you, you just don't see any discrepancy at all between theory and experiment, and this spectrum of radiation agrees with Gamow's theory <coughs> over orders of magnitude. So that's the uh, spectrum of energies in these microwave photons. And I said the universe was uh, approximately homogeneous and isotropic. It looks the same in all directions. And in fact, this picture here, the top picture here, shows you the temperature, the apparent temperature of, those mic of that microwave oven as you look in different directions. And it's much better engineered than your microwave oven in your kitchen. You know, there are always some things that don't heat up because they're at the corners of the oven. Okay. This is all the same all over, and the temperature is 2.7 degrees Kelvin. It's not quite the same in all directions. I'm cheating a little bit. Of course, the Earth is moving. The Earth is moving around the Sun. The Sun is moving around the galaxy. The galaxy is moving towards other galaxies. And this means that if you look in the direction of motion, the microwaves look a little bit hotter. If you look in the backwards direction, they look a little bit colder. And uh, that's what's shown here. Here, the cold bits are blue, and here, the hot bits are red. Actually, they're not red. It's just the computer you know, draws to make it look like they're hot and cold. But, okay. but this is a very small difference. This is only one thousandth okay, of the temperature. To one part of the thousand, the thing is completely the same, whatever direction you look Okay, so that's a very good piece of evidence for the uh, microwave background radiation, for the expansion of the universe. The third piece of evidence is if you look at the abundances of light elements. Uh, you remember Mendeleev with his enormous table of uh, dozens of elements? Where do they all come from? Well, the commonest uh, element in the universe is hydrogen. The second most common is helium. And the abundances of hydrogen, helium, and other light elements are believed to have been fixed when the universe was very small. Uh, in fact, another uh, six or so orders of magnitude smaller than when the microwave background radiation was produced. At that time, the universe was sufficiently hot and sufficiently dense that nuclear reactions took place. In fact, the, the whole uh, universe at that time was a little bit like a, a nuclear reactor or a, a nuclear bomb, and all the nuclear reactions produced deuterium, uh, helium, 
lithium and so on. Now I have a, another picture showing calculations of that. Well, the computer has a picture somewhere. It's frustrating when it's oh, there it is. So uh, these are the abundances, the various different uh, types of elements. Uh, this is the density of the matter in the universe. Uh, so as a, as a function of the density, you can calculate how much helium there should be, how much deuterium there should be, how much lithium there should be. And these tasteful blue boxes here correspond to the measurements which are made by astrophysicists. And what you find is that the measurements agree uh, with the theory if the density of the universe is about one hundredth. I'll explain in a bit more detail what that hundredth means. In fact, I've got the same thing on this uh, overlay here. Okay, this is a similar picture to that one here. Abundances of the various different elements. Uh, this is the present density of matter in the universe. And what this concordance tells us is the density of matter in the universe is about one-tenth or one-hundredth of what would be required to stop the present expansion of the universe and cause it to collapse again on itself. This is important because in just a second we'll come to a theory which tells us that the universe should have this critical density. Now the one other comment which I wanted to make here was that these calculations depend on how many different types of neutrinos there are. And in fact, these calculations only work if there are three neutrinos. And so this is a direct connection then between the particle physics that we saw a couple of transparencies back and the history of the universe. The light elements are produced by these uh, interactions. And those interactions produce the right numbers if and only if there are only three different types of neutrinos. Now, I mentioned a moment ago uh, this question of whether the universe is going to expand forever or whether it's going to eventually collapse again on itself. And uh, in this picture here I've actually uh, illustrated uh, the three different possibilities. Uh, let me start off with this picture in the middle. This would be a universe in which there is lots and lots of matter so that the universe expands for a while and then it stops and then it collapses again. And uh, in fact, of course, this is the situation of an apple, because uh, you know, if you throw the apple, it always comes down again. It's very difficult to throw the apple hard enough that it can escape from all the matter in the Earth and dash off to infinity. Uh, if you do that, of course, you're probably using a spaceship, and uh, the line here, representing a universe, which escapes from its own gravity is a little bit like the trajectory of a spaceship which you send off to, uh, to Mars. So these are two extreme possibilities. The universe may expand forever or it may collapse again. Now, there's another possibility, which is this one here. It's just the boundary between the two. And this is called a flat universe. And it's a universe which is just on the borderline between collapsing again and carrying on expanding forever. It's called flat because it, in this universe uh, geometry is in some sense Euclidean. I mean, you probably never ask yourself this question. I mean, at school they teach you, or at least I can see two people who haven't done geometry yet, but most of you did geometry in school and they taught you about Euclidean geometry. Right? Why Euclidean geometry? Why is the universe described by Euclidean geometry and not some other sort of geometry? That corresponds to the question of why is the universe approximately flat? Why is space approximately flat? And the answer to that is possibly provided by the next transparency. Uh, this is uh, the theory of uh, inflationary cosmology, which is addressed to the question, why is the universe so large and old? 
Why is its density so close to this critical flat value? Why did they teach you Euclidean geometry in school and not some other sort of Riemannian geometry? And why is the universe so homogeneous on all different scales? The idea of cosmological inflation is that during the early history of the universe, uh, there may have been an exponential expansion of the universe, a little bit like the German currency in 1923, which made the universe blow up extremely rapidly. And this, according to the theory, is driven by the energy of something very much like the Higgs field, which is supposed to give masses to all the different elementary particles. Now, here I have uh, a picture of uh, how this inflation is uh, supposed to work. And uh, here I actually have a demo. mention one other puzzling feature of the universe. If you look at the universe, then very distant parts of the universe uh, seem to be very much the same. This is a puzzle in conventional cosmology because very distant parts of the universe had no way to communicate with each other. How did they know to tell each other to behave in the same way? And the answer provided by inflation is that very early in the history of the universe, in fact, these distant objects were very close together. And this is illustrated on this little picture up here. Uh, here is your uh, favorite inflatable rubber object. It might be a party balloon or weather balloon or something else. And the idea is that very distant parts of the universe started off very close together, much like, I don't know, maybe the people in the front row can see them, there's some little stars now you inflate the universe. You have to imagine that this occurs extremely rapidly in the very early universe. And what happens is that very nearby objects go to very distant parts of the universe, but they still remember to behave in the same way. And so in that way, you get a universe which is approximately homogeneous and isotropic being blown up from a very compressed little rubber object. I think we better stop it before. We better stop it before there's another big bang and you get another big piece of the universe. Now, uh, I said that one of the things that inflation was supposed to do for you was to explain the size of the universe. Well, clearly, if you blow up your weather balloon for long enough, it's going to be big enough, right? Another thing which I said was that it was supposed to explain why the universe looks flat. Imagine that you're an ant, and you're on the surface of the universe. And of course, the universe as a whole is round, but you wouldn't know that. And if you were an ant here, it would look flat as far as you were concerned. According to this theory, the universe is approximately flat, but you know, maybe if you went billions and billions and billions of light years, it wouldn't be flat anymore, but it looks flat to a very good approximation. Now, this theory has received some possible confirmation from the COBE satellite a few years ago. The COBE satellite detected minuscule uh, variations in the I'm trying to get the right picture. Yep. This is the microwave background radiation that we saw earlier on. And I made a big deal out of the fact that it's pretty much the same whichever direction you look, except maybe if you look in the direction in which the Earth is flying. But it turns out if you look very, very carefully indeed, and this is what the Kobe satellite did, in fact on very small scales on a very small magnitude, there are fluctuations. Small scales in the sense of temperature. This is a very small temperature, a millionth of a degree Kelvin. This is a thousandth of a degree Kelvin. The whole temperature is a few degrees Kelvin. 
if you look at these very small temperature differences, you find little hot spots and little cold spots. That is just in agreement with the theory of cosmological inflation. And if you believe uh, this theory, then these little hot and cold spots have to do with the quantum effects of those mysterious Higgs bosons that we're all looking for. Now, before drawing to a close, there's one or two other little cosmological issues which I would at least like to advertise to you. One of them is that, uh, according to astrophysicists, more than 90% of the matter in the universe is invisible. And uh, I have a picture of it. <laughs> right? Uh, our galaxy and all the other galaxies that we know of are little light areas, okay, here's the galaxy viewed end on, sitting in an enormous cloud of invisible stuff. And according to inflation, the total density of stuff in the universe should be that critical density which makes the universe flat. According to the calculations of light elements, the amount of ordinary material in the universe isn't sufficient to close the universe, and the difference between the two is provided by this additional invisible, unconventional matter, the so-called dark matter. What could this dark matter be? Well, it could be elementary particles. And a couple of candidates are uh, very fashionable. One is neutrinos. Neutrinos at least exist. And if neutrinos even weighed a very small amount, that would be sufficient to be the dark matter in the universe. And their accelerator experiments, including one done by uh, some of your colleagues uh, here in Melbourne, to uh, test this possibility. Another possibility is that you have some new, more exotic uh, sort of particle, uh, maybe weighing 10 or 100 times as much as a proton, uh, but something which is uh, neutral, and so you can't see it. And uh, this is now being searched for, uh, for example, in experiments at LEP. I, I've talked about uh, LEP as being the, the largest accelerator that exists in the uni in, uh, universe. <laughs> now, sometimes us guys at CERN get a little bit carried away. <laughs> Certainly the largest accelerator on the surface of the Earth. Uh, this is... Now we're starting the construction of uh, another project called, uh, imaginatively enough, a large hadron collider. This is a, a device which uh, accelerator which is actually going to sit in the same tunnel as LEP. So this is a picture of that LEP tunnel which you saw earlier on. It's about 100 metres underground. We're planning to put uh, another accelerator with uh, stronger magnets in there to accelerate protons to much higher energies than is currently possible using LEP. Uh, I said much stronger magnets. These are quite a technical challenge to build. Uh, here are some of them which have already been built and are currently being uh, tested uh, on the CERN site. Uh, there will be uh, a ring of these magnets which uh, will be providing collisions for various different uh, experiments, like the experiments which you saw at LEP, but a, a new set of experiments. Uh, one of these experiments is called uh, ATLAS, and uh, since this is one which uh, some of your local colleagues are involved with, I have a, brought along a little picture of this. Uh, you may have thought that the uh, LEP experiments were big, uh, but uh, look at these little people down here. But again, it operates on the same principle. You collide the protons in the middle, uh, and you see all the stuff uh, coming out, and uh, what you hope to see coming out are Higgs bosons, supersymmetric particles, dark matter, evidence for unification, and so on and so forth. So, let me now finish just with a, a very brief uh, summary. I've tried to convince you that, uh, during the course of this talk, that there is a sort of symbiosis between particle physics and cosmology. That, uh, although they look like they're very different ends of the energy scale, or the size scale, in fact, uh, they're very close together. 
And uh, that in fact, the sort of accelerators that we do our experiments with, like LEP and the LHC, are telescopes as well as microscopes. And uh, for those of you who want to look further, here are some uh, web addresses, which I hope you'll find interesting. <coughs> Thank you. This thing here, which is, everybody can see this one I do? Uh, when I said this is a quark, in fact what you see here is a shower of uh, particles with charge, and uh, some of them hit various different parts of the apparatus, deposit their energy, so there's a, a tremendous spurt of energy going off in this direction. Okay? It's, not, it's not a single part, and you see the same thing over this direction. So you don't actually see the quark directly. <coughs> 
and uh, the sort of image that we have in mind is that uh, the quark is produced at the interaction point and then it hits some sort of imaginary brick wall and produces a spray of particles which shoot through. You imagine hitting a brick wall and there's going to be a shower of bricks going out. Okay? So uh, these things here in some sense are bricks which are sent flying by the quark. That brick wall is a sort of uh, jail in which the quark sits. That jail is something like 10 to the minus 13 centimeters across. So what happens is that you know, from 10 to the minus 16 to 10 to the minus 15 to 10 to the minus 14 seconds, uh, centimeters, the quark is escaping. But then it hits the wall of the jail and it doesn't come out itself, but instead, instead it sends out the shower of bricks. Now let's come to the uh, gluon picture. <coughs> now the, the picture there is very much the same. What happens is that uh, at these distances smaller than 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, maybe 10 to the minus 16, maybe 10 to the minus 15, maybe 10 to the minus 14, there is some probability, it's not negligible, maybe 10% or so, that one of these quarks will flash off a gluon the same way that an electron can easily send off a photon. But this gluon is also inside the jail and can't get out. So the finite range is the size of the jail wall. Okay? However, if you analyze the properties of the gluon inside that jail wall, okay, it looks like a massless particle, just like a photon. Okay, so the finite size is provided by the jail. The standard model does predict that there might be some interactions which change very often. And in fact, uh, in principle, you could imagine some sort of weird interactions whereby complex nuclei would decay, but not individual pairs. But those processes are unimaginably slow, and there's no chance that anybody can actually see it. Predictions for proton decay come from extensions of the standard model. These sort of ideas to unify the forces. And, uh, well, you know, if you talk like this, I didn't have time to go into all the things that might have been interested in. But, for example, if you want to understand the origin of the matter in the world, the matter in the world, that's the role where these extensions of the standard model can play a role, particularly in the interaction between life and the proton decay. back to uh, my uh, expanding universe. Okay. As the universe expands, okay, look at one of these little points on the surface here. In some sense that is at rest. It's at, it's at rest is where I'm going to stop this before. Okay, no, this is in some sense uh, at rest with respect to folks the universe as a whole. Now, when I talked about uh, this inhomogeneity, this anisotropy in the microwave background radiation, that was because you can imagine some ant moving across the surface of the universe here. Okay? And if it moves in this direction, okay, uh, then this part of the microwave background radiation is hotter. So that is a pictorial representation of the stationary frame of rest reference and something moving with the perspective. Yeah, you don't look like you're satisfied with your answer. It does mean that there, there is a frame of reference where the universe is the same. There is, uh, within this sort of cosmology, a preferred local frame of reference. 
us as a whole seems to be against it, yes. I'm just interested to give a special explanation of how the What happened is that uh, uh, neurons and the other sort of particles which are protecting the neurons are, are charged particles. Uh, if you have uh, a charged particle as it passes through the air, ionized the air, and you can use this to make sparks, okay, which uh, enable the uh, which enable a current to pass. That's the principle of a very large number of I might just comment, by the way, is that they uh, once threw a, flew a cosmic ray detector in a Concorde, and they uh, they put it in the luggage compartment underneath the seat, and uh, they recorded one incredibly high energy shower of particles, just like one of these shower of particles here, with an energy of uh, hundreds of times uh, the proton mass. And they traced back the vertex to find out where the interaction had taken place, and uh, it, it occurred in somebody's seat. <laughs> photon between two particles with the same charge, then they will work out. Uh, if you have particles of opposite charge, uh, then they attract. And uh, the best analogy which anybody succeeds in coming up with for that is uh, like uh, two bugger plants. I understand it's not big one like As far as I can make out, putting it in part, it's difficult to describe the analogy. I hope you know enough about that. Thank you. 
what people believe is that if, if we were really sitting at, at rest, okay, like one of these little marks on the surface of the weather balloon, then in fact the thing would look absolutely the same in all directions. Uh, it's not the different parts of it, but <coughs> when I have this little picture here, this little picture we believe only has to do with the motion of the Earth uh, relative to this Mafia reference frame. If we are moving towards that bit, and that's why it looks like that. If we're moving away from that bit, that's why it looks colder. And that's just, if you like, the Doppler effect. It's not because those pieces of the universe are really hotter or colder. It's just a Doppler effect. We're moving towards something, and it looks like it. <coughs> On the other hand, if you look at this bit here, these hot bits and cold bits probably really are hotter and colder. And in fact, if you look at any individual one here, you can't be absolutely sure uh, because the experiments here so far are not sufficiently precise. But very probably this bit really is colder than that bit over there. And that happens because you know, we have this expansion of the universe which is driven not by an air pump, which is driven by some field. That field is not a, a classical thing, it's a quantum thing. It's a quantum thing, it fluctuates, it jiggles around. And uh, the theory is that those jiggles were a little bit different over here from what they were over there. Uh, you mean a big bang is It, 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 it's very much like that. And there's some features in common, for example, like I mentioned that as the universe expands, it cools. Okay, And that's the same thing as what happened in the chemical explosion. You have hot gases, as they expand, they do work, they cool. Okay. Uh, however, there's one thing which you have to be a little bit careful about. And it actually goes back to your question in the front row. Uh, you should not imagine that you can somehow be outside this explosion looking in. What happens is that everywhere in the universe it uh, explodes simultaneously and behaves in very, very nearly at least exactly the same way. So there's no way of being outside the explosion. The universe, the explosion is universal. We're all in it together. Nobody has yet discovered a supersymmetric particle, or at least they have this morning when I checked on the web. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
and maybe you know, tomorrow they, they will. Uh, in fact, uh, at, uh, at this moment they are uh, working with the uh, left accelerator to uh, increase its energy. So there's always a possibility that uh, they will uh, increase the energy and uh, you know, they will find some new particles. So every morning I should check in to find out what's happening. Uh, but no supersymmetric particles have been uh, found uh, up to date. Uh, and in fact, all that we have at the moment is we have uh, lower limits on the possible masses of those supersymmetric particles. And, uh, even, a, even the lightest of them must weigh at least uh, 50 times the mass of the proton. Even the lightest supersymmetric particle must uh, weigh uh, as much as uh, the medium sized nucleus. Now you asked about uh, string theory. Uh, string theory, at least as far as we've been able to understand it up to now, doesn't yet make any specific prediction about how heavy those supersymmetric particles uh, should be. So uh, those of us, like myself, who like string theory are uh, not yet uh, particularly worried. Uh, we see. Is that enough of an answer to your question? Okay. Gravity is, is somewhat uh, different from the uh, from the other forces, and uh, it's rather technical to uh, explain uh, the difference, but. Uh, Although there are certain similarities with the, with the weak, strong, and, and, with, uh, and electromagnetic forces, there are also some very basic differences. Those very basic differences mean that we expect that any sort of unification of the other forces, if it takes place at all, would only take place at incredibly high energies, something like uh, 10 to the power 19 uh, GeV. And that's precisely you know, what string theory is our best chance of doing, is the unification of gravity with the other forces. Uh, the reason for that is well, it's linked to the fact that gravity is, of course, an incredibly weak force at the level of elementary particles. It only seems significant to us because the gravitational force of lots of little particles all adds up in a coherent way. But if you look at the gravitational force between two electrons, it's completely negligible. Okay, I, I succeed in getting the page which tells us uh, what they're doing <coughs> Lab, but uh, all it tells us is they're not doing anything at lap because, uh, <laughs> because the uh, vacuum tube is blocked. Uh, but it's not another beer bottle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've got a cool thing to do at home. Yeah. Uh -huh. 